Thank you, thank Professor you. Haruso. Uh, thank you, Drs. Nagler and uh, Monty for inviting me. And I apologize, I couldn't get here yesterday because of the flood in Houston, but I changed the talk to cover the elderly and the dance. So uh, for whoever has stayed, you will not be missing anything. Also, I'm very glad some of you have stayed because you will get to know the treatment of what I believe will be uh, the treatment of adult and elderly ALL three to five years from now. I know that 90% of the ALL experts believe that pediatric inspired regimens are the standard up to the age of 40. I'm going to show you that uh, that suggests that perhaps we need to change the treatment and go more with less asparginase and more with the antibody therapies into the frontline uh, treatment. So let me try to show you the data to convince you of this. And I know that uh, Dr. Yunus has an opera, so I'll finish definitely on time. Uh, this is what the pediatric experts report in many series. They uh, show that the cure rate in pediatric ALL is about uh, 90%. I think it's probably in the range of 80% because many of the children are not eligible for the protocols. And they managed to do this not by discovering new treatments, but by using the same old chemotherapy drugs from the 70s and early 80s, optimize the regimens and cure more of the patients. But this is at a big expense. Many of these children are cured. They have uh, significant physical and uh, uh, socio-emotional problems uh, because of uh, the intensity and extent of the chemotherapy. In adult ALL, we've uh, used the identical regimens and the cure rate has plateaued at about 50% if you take anybody under the age of 60. Now, this is not because of lack ex of expertise. It is simply because there are four entities which are different in their incidence and prognosis in children versus adults. The first two are shown in red and yellow, the hyperdeployed and ETV6 ranks one. These constitute close to 40% of pediatric ALL. They have a very favorable prognosis. They constitute less than 10% of adult ALL. The third very important entity is Philadelphia positive ALL. Historically, it used to have a very poor prognosis. It's a quarter of adult ALL. I'll show you it's even more if you incorporate Philadelphia-like ALL, and particularly among subgroups like Hispanics. I don't know about the French or the Mediterranean groups. This needs to be investigated. This is much less common in pediatric ALL with 5% of the patients. The third, the fourth category, which is not shown, is a recently uh, described entity, which is Philadelphia-like. And I think Philadelphia-like is a misnomer. It was called Philadelphia-like because the genomic profile was similar to Philadelphia-positive ALL. But I think we should change the term and call them maybe CRLF2 with or without JAK2 mutations and able translocations. Regardless, Philadelphia-like is less common in pediatric than adult ALL, and it has also an unfavorable prognosis. So this is what Philadelphia-like prognosis looked historically. The cure rate was 25% versus 50% with the others, and I'll show you at the end data that suggests that with the introduction of the antibodies, Philadelphia-like may not be adverse anymore. So how do we describe Philadelphia-like? So if you take 100 patients with adult ALL, 25 will have Philadelphia-like. 20 of the 25 will have CRLF2 overexpression with or without JAK2 mutation. I do not think they respond to JAK to inhibitors. I don't think ruxolitinib is worthwhile, but we have data with the antibodies that shows that things have improved significantly with the addition of enotuzumab and uh, blinatumumab in elderly ALL. I do think that venetoclax or BCL2, BCLXL inhibitors are going to play an important role, not only in this subset, but across the board. And I'll show you one slide at the end. The other five patients, will have able translocations, and these we treat today in an identical fashion to Philadelphia positive ALL. So we give them ponatinib and the mini hyper CVD now. I think, um, uh, so then the next question is, 
uh, where are we in the management of adult in ALL in general? I'm going to show you data that Philadelphia positive ALL is not adverse anymore. I'll show you data with ponatinib and chemotherapy, but also with TKIs and antibodies. Uh, the next uh, breakthrough is an old one where we added rituximab to chemotherapy. We started this in 2000 at MD Anderson and it became a standard of care probably in 2016 following the French randomized trial. We are using now ofatumumab and I'll show you data that it's better perhaps than rituximab. The big breakthrough are the antibodies targeting CD22, inotuzumab, which is an antibody bound to calichiamycin, and blinatumumab, which is a bispecific CD3, CD19 antibody. These are approved and used by most people as single agents in refractory relapse ALL. Since the FDA approval, I have never used either as a single agent therapy because they are very expensive and also they do not give you a good treatment value. I always use them in combination with chemotherapy, mini hyper CBD, and this is already published and shows a doubling of the survival rate. CAR T cells are a scientific breakthrough. I do not think they are going to be that important in the future in ALL. I think they will be used as salvage therapies. Perhaps we will find a better role for them in uh, first remission with minimal residual disease, and perhaps they will be replaced with allogeneic CAR T cells. So a lot of people are working on that, and that will make them less expensive and also easier to use. And finally, the importance of minimal residual disease. Most of the literature emphasizes MRD at three months from diagnosis. We're starting to use it in complete remission to manage the patients, modify the treatment, and move them to transplant if needed. The last thing which I don't have on the slide is something I mentioned briefly, venetoclax or the BCL2, BCLXL inhibitors. At MD Anderson, we started using the hyper cvad in 1992, and I presented the first data in the first 30 patients in Lebanon in 1993. This is when I met some of my longest and dearest friends, uh, Nabil Shamsuddin and many others. Uh, we switched CNS prophylaxis to intrathecal early on, and this is now standard of care. We introduced rituximab in 1998. This is now standard of care. Um, and uh, we started adding the TKIs to hyper in 2000 for Philadelphia positive disease, and this is now a standard of care. Clofarabin and liposomal vincristin are minor breakthroughs, me too. They shouldn't be that important. But I think this is the biggest breakthrough, the addition of the antibodies to chemotherapy in both frontline and salvage therapy. Let's start with Philadelphia positive ALL. So uh, this is the history of the disease. It used to be the most refractory of the ALLs together with the translocation 1411Q23. So this is the data before 2000. If patients had the donor, the three-year survival or potential cure rate was about 35 to 40%. No donors, they almost died all the time. Uh, I don't think there was even a cure rate of 10% with chemotherapy alone in adult ALL. In pediatric ALL, they could be cured or they were uh, curable with intensive chemotherapy alone. And I think that's because Philadelphia positive ALL in children is different from Philadelphia positive adult ALL. Now, what I don't show is that when we started adding um, imatinib to chemotherapy, we started having a cure rate of about 40%. Now, after that, the French came with this set of data where they used desatinib with minimal chemotherapy, and they showed that without intensive chemotherapy, the five-year survival rate was still low. But there was one important finding from that study. They reported that most of the relapses had a T315I mutation. They also reported that a quarter of the patients had a T315I mutation at diagnosis by next generation sequencing. We have used now a different methodology, the duplex sequencing, and we cannot reproduce this finding. So I think it's a clonal selection that you cannot detect at diagnosis, but it is certainly true that most of the relapses are with the T315I mutation. 
Also, with TKI alone, the complete molecular response rate, which allows you to avoid allogeneic transplantation, is low, only 24%. So we concluded from this data that we still needed the intensive chemotherapy, but also that we needed to use ponatinib instead of uh, imatinib or the second generation TKIs. So this is the data with hyper CVAD ponatinib, which we published uh, repeatedly. We have now over 100 patients, and I'll show you why we changed. But let's look at the data. So it is eight courses of intensive chemotherapy with ponatinib, the ponatinib is toxic at 45 milligram, but at 30 milligram, it is quite safe. And once they are in complete molecular response, we reduce to 15 milligrams. Also, because the patients were living longer with eight intrathecals, we had relapses, 10%. We increased the intrathecals to 12. So let me show you the data now in close to 100 patients. Uh, universal CR rate, but we are used to using hyper -CVAD. Uh, no mortality, and the complete molecular response rate is 85%. And this is the uh, estimated five-year survival. Now, 71% of the patients are alive, mostly without disease. Very few of them have gone to allogeneic transplant. But the price to pay is you have to give the ponatinib continuously. We don't know when we can stop. Now, how about the value of transplant? So this is the data with a landmark analysis of patients who did not undergo stem cell transplant versus the ones who did, and there's no benefit from the transplantation if the patients are in a complete molecular response. So today, we give ponatinib-based therapy. If they are in complete molecular response, we give them the choice. You can go for the transplant. You still have to do post-transplant maintenance with ponatinib for at least two years, or you can forego the transplant, and we have to give the ponatinib indefinitely or at least for five years. As I mentioned, we started giving the intrathecals for 12 doses, and now we do not have any CNS relapses. So that's a very important finding, while in the past, because they lived quite long with the eight intrathecals, we had nine or 17 uh, CNS relapses. So you need 12 intrathecals there. Now, can we do better than this? Can you, like an APL, cure Philadelphia positive ALL without chemotherapy? An APL, which was a bad disease, we can cure the patients now with atriarsenic trioxide with or without a little bit of mylotarx. So can you do the same thing in Philadelphia positive ALL? So this is the data in refractory relapse, Philadelphia-positive ALL with lenatumumab and inotuzumab. Marrow CR rates of 35 to 60%, better than with intensive chemotherapy. So then uh, there is a group that decided, so we decided to do the lenatumumab ponatinib. Uh, and this is what we're doing now in the front line in the patients who do not want the intensive chemotherapy. So no chemotherapy, only uh, blenatumumab with ponatinib. Uh, but uh, the blenatumumab is usually for 48 courses. The ponatinib is indefinite. Now, there is already data that suggests that this approach could be a good one. So this is from the Europeans uh, from Italy. And this was presented at the last year. The satinib followed by blenatumumab 63 patients reported uh, the molecular response rate is still lower than you would like it to be. So many of these patients are going to transplant. But with a short follow-up of about nine months, there's no doubt that the survival is very good. However, even with the early data, there were 15 patients who started increasing their PCR. And when uh, Dr. Chiaretti looked at those 15 patients, um, uh, seven of uh, six of the seven that had mutations had a T315I mutation. So I think still you need ponatinib with the blenatumumab. Uh, and I think you need to start blenatumumab earlier than they did, which was at three months into the ponatinib therapy. So what are we doing? Uh, even though the hyper CVAD ponatinib is highly successful, the community practice is not endorsing it because they have problems with the hyper CVAD. So we designed a lesser chemotherapy regimen, the mini hyper CVD with ponatinib, 
And then we have another regimen with Mabul. We are going to compare these two and see which one wins. But if I have a patient today, if he's younger, I would still do the hyper-CV at ponatinib. If he wants the protocol, I'll do the hyper-CVD ponatinib with less chemotherapy. So the problem of Philadelphia positive ALL is, I think, solved. We have the tools to cure the disease. We just have to optimize the treatments. Now, what do we do with the other patients? So in pre-BALL, which is about 50 plus percent of the patients, as I mentioned, in 2000, we added rituximab to hyper -CVAD. This was taken by the French group in Burkitt uh, Leukemia, uh, randomizing the patients to short intensive chemotherapy with or without rituximab, and they demonstrated a significant survival benefit. So this became a standard of care. Then they used the same with the longer-term intensive chemotherapy with or without rituximab in pre-BALL, and they showed the survival benefits. So this also became a standard of care. But here I would pause for a second and think about the issue. If, if rituximab, which has zero activity in pre-BALL, was able to increase the cure rate by 10 to 15% when added to chemotherapy, how much more can we improve the data in adult and elderly ALL if we add chemotherapy, if we add antibodies which are not only effective as single agents, as I'll show you, but they are superior to intensive chemotherapy. So this is why I think the future is going to be with much less intensive chemotherapy with the antibody cocktails added to chemotherapy. Uh, and I think the cure rate is going to go beyond 70 plus percent in adult and elderly ALM. And I'll show you some data. Now, um, most of the ALL community, 90% of the ALL experts, certainly when this talk, that the Angelo, uh, have reverted to believing that pediatric inspired regimens are superior to the standard adult ALL regimens. And that is true because the pediatric inspired regimens use a lot of aspergenes and Christian steroids, so the non myelosuppressive regimens. And the standard ALL regimens have abandoned some of the principles of the pediatric regimens, such as shorter pump maintenance, reliance on allogeneic and autologous transplantation. Now, this is the intergroup study that was done prospectively, and uh, Dr. Stock recently published that the estimated five-year survival is 60%. So keep this in mind, estimated five-year survival, 60%, in patients who are under the age of 40. So these are patients under the age of 40 of a median age of 24 years. At MD Anderson from 2006 to 2012, we used the pediatric inspired regimens. Then in 2012, we were not seeing a better outcome compared to the hyper -CVAD. Now remember the hyper -CVAD is a pediatric inspired regimen, but it does not use aspergenase during the induction. Uh, and so we have much less aspergenase toxicities when there's no active disease. When we compare the, the hyper CVAD to the augmented BFM, the CR rates were similar and the survivals were similar, an estimated five year survival rate of 60% in patients under the age of 40. So in 2012, we went back to the hyper CVAD because we are familiar with the hyper CVAD toxicities it is essentially myelosuppression complications. With the augmented BFM, it's the aspergenase toxicities, allergies, DIC, pancreatitis in 10%, liver dysfunction in about 30%, thrombotic events, etc. So you have a choice. If you're comfortable with the aspergenase toxicities, you can use the pediatric inspired regimens. At MD Anderson, we went back to the hyper -CVAD. Now, when I give this talk, people come at the end, I say, look, we are not able to deliver the hyper -CVAD in the community practice. There's too much toxicities, particularly with the even courses. So that is true. And you don't have to use the RRC at three grams per meter square. You can use it at 1.5 to two grams per meter square with less toxicity. The hyper -CVAD stays the same. So in 2012, we did not have blinatumumab or inotuzumab. So we went back to the hyper -CVAD, but we used ofatumumab instead. So the identical regimen, we're publishing on this. The CR rate is again quite high, one 
death during induction. When the French used hyper-CVAD regimen and published on it, their induction mortality was 10%, but this was done more in a community French uh, group rather than as a single institution. Now look at the data with hyper-CVAD of optimumab. So the estimated five-year survival, 60%. But this is up to the age of 60. It's not up to the age of 40. Now, let me show you some data. So when we compare the ofatumumab to rituximab, we improve the outcome. And the benefit is not restricted to CD20 positive. It works also in lower CD20 levels. And finally, the data by age. So the red curve are patients under the age of 40. And here you see that the estimated five-year survival is over 70%. So even with the historical data, if you use a good intensive regimen with ofatumumab, we're not at a cure rate of 50%. We're over 70%, at least from the MD Anderson data. This is up to the age of 60, not up to the age of 40. So this is our current regimen, still the hyper CVAD of Atumumab, but now we added Enotuzumab to the induction and Blinatumumab as a maintenance. The intensive chemotherapy is for four cycles. The maintenance is for only one year. If this works at MD Anderson with a five-year survival over 70 plus percent, this could change the whole way we treat adult elderly, and perhaps pediatric ALL in the future. Now, let's talk about some additional things. The first one is minimal residual disease. So if you look at the, this curve, patients who are MRD positive, who are adults, their cure rate is less than 10%. And it's improved with intensive chemotherapy. So without uh, MRD disease three months uh, from diagnosis, the cure rate is quite high. If they are MRD positive, uh, the cure rate is less than 20%. Now there's a treatment for this. The German group used blinatumumab for patients who are MRD positive in complete remission. They treated 110 evaluable patients. 80% of the patients become MRD negative. And now you can cure these patients. The est estimated cure rate is 40 to 50%. So now blinatumumab can be used to treat MRD positive disease as a standard of care, and then you can decide whether you send the patients to transplant or not. The blue curve are patients in first remission, so the potential cure rate is close to 50% in patients who are MRD positive if you use blinatumumab in this setting. So uh, at our institution, blinatumumab is a standard of care, but inotuzumab is, is probably as effective and easier to get because it's a short infusion on day one and eight, once a month for four times instead of a four uh, months, uh, four week continuous infusion every six weeks. So we're trying to see if inotuzumab can produce the same results as blinatumumab. Now with all this new data, the question is, well, when do I transplant a patient with ALL, and the top three are our current indications. ALL, MLL, so any translocation 11Q23, precursor T-cell ALL, until we see if venetoclax and AML type therapies improve the outcome in this subset, and the uncommon entities of complex cytogenetics and near hypoploid with P53. Now, the most common classical indications for transplant used to be Philadelphia positive ALL, PCR positive, Philadelphia like ALL, and ALL MRD positive. I think these can be taken care of with linatumumab, and then you can decide whether to do the transplant or not. So next I'm going to come to the revolution in adult and elderly ALL. And the revolution comes in two flavors depending on your beliefs. It's like whether you're an Armenian Orthodox or a Maronite Catholic. Some people, such as myself, believe that the antibodies are going to be the solution. And they come as CD19 or CD22 antibodies, but perhaps also CD123. The other group believes that the CAR T cells are the breakthrough, and we're fortunate to have those two competing strategies uh, ongoing. 
So, um, as I mentioned, um, these strategies are FDA approved. Linatumumab is FDA approved. Inotuzumab is FDA approved in 2014, 2017 for the treatment of single agent refractory relapse ALL. I've never used them as single agents, and that's because when you use them as single agents and compare them to standard of care intensive chemotherapy, you can get a definite significant survival benefit, but it is of a limited benefit for the amount of money you pay. And these were the two randomized studies that led to the FDA approval. Uh, both of them were in refractory relapse CLL, but single agent either blinatumumab, and you see a doubling of the CR rate, or inotuzumab versus intensive chemotherapy, again, more than a doubling of the CR rate and an improvement in the potential cure rate. So um, in about 2014, we started combining these drugs with mini-CVD. So we said hyper CVAD is a regimen people do not like. We're going to remove the adriamycin because you cannot combine it safely with inotuzumab. <laughs> We reduced the cyclophosphamide dose by 50%. We reduced the methotrexate dose by more than 75%. And the RSE in this regimen is only 0.5 gram per meter square, not three grams per meter square. So this is our newest regimen, four cycles of intensive chemotherapy with the low dose of inotuzumab. So the dose of inotuzumab that causes venoocclusive disease is 5.4 milligram per meter square, up to 7.2 milligrams per meter square. We're using only 2.7 milligram per meter square, so a much lower dose, fractionated. And then comes the blinatumumab. So the idea here in the salvage is to distance the last inotuzumab dose from the transplant by at least three months also to reduce the incidence of inoclusive disease. And we use also Ursadiol as prophylaxis. So with these maneuvers, the incidence of venoocclusive disease and refractory relapse ALL is back down to about 8%, which is significantly better than the previous uh, reports. I'm not showing the data in refractory relapse ALL, but I want to show you the data in elderly ALL because this is the window to how to introduce these regimens into the adult population. So in elderly ALL, we said, well, we can use the uh, hyper-CVD, you know, but we cannot use it in people up to the age of 60 because I showed you that the potential cure rate is 60%. But if you look at people over the age of 60, the estimated three-year survival is anywhere from 10 to 20%, even in the best hands. So we said, well, let's use the mini hyper CVD in oblina in elderly patients after we showed that in the salvage setting, the CR rate was very high and the three-year survival was close to 40%. So very good data in the salvage. So we started using this in people over the age of 60, universal CR rate, much easier chemotherapy, no mortality, and most of the patients become MRD negative. So this shows you that the third of the patients or the quarter of the patients who are Philadelphia-like are not remaining MRD positive anymore, which is very interesting and very encouraging. So this shows the results of the mini hyper CVD you know, compared to our historical data of hyper CVAD in patients over the age of 60 years. So at five years, the estimated five-year survival is close to 50% versus the historical data of 23%. Now, um, how about venoocclusive disease? Even though we're not sending these patients to transplant, elderly patients have liver problems. So we still see venoocclusive disease at a rate of about 10% in these patients. Um, now, on this slide, I showed the survival. So I showed you that the estimated survival is close to 50% but the remission duration rate is much higher. Why is that? It's because there are patients who are still dying in complete remission. So even though the chemotherapy is mini chemotherapy, the patients are dying. So let's look at why the patients are dying in complete remission. So this shows the death in people under the age of 60, uh, under uh, 60 to 70. 
This is 60 to 70. This is the survival. No, this is, uh, this is the survival. 60 to 70 over 70. 60 to 70, an estimated five year survival close to 60%. So even in the patient 60 to 70, we're able to cure more than 50%. Now this is the 70 plus. They are still dying, even though they are not relapsing. Why are they dying? They are dying because of either mostly sepsis, seven deaths in septic shock, all seven over the age of 70, and this is mostly during the consolidation, course three, course four, and even during the pump. There are also patients who are developing MDS and AML because they are living much longer. So the natural history of the disease is maybe that they have a defective stem cell that would produce MDS and AML. It's not because of the chemotherapy, because the chemotherapy is much shorter than the hyperceval. So what we decided to do is in people over the age of 70 to limit the chemotherapy to two cycles and rely on Eno and Blina to cure the patients. So this is what we're doing in patients over the age of 70. Only two courses. One is mini CVD, one is mini methotrexate RAC, two cycles of Enotuzumab, then Blina for four cycles, and then another Blina. So the Enotuzumab now is down to 1.5 per meter square for over the age of 70, and that should eliminate vena occlusive disease. Now, what about using blinatumumab with, say, pump maintenance? So this is data from Dr. Advani, 31 patients. You see the CR rate is not universal, it's 60%, and even at one year, um, barely 65% of the patients are alive. So that's why I think the mini hyper CVD in Oblina is a much better approach. What about the, um, the CAR T cells? So this is the ELIANA trial. Remember, the ELIANA trial is in young people under the age of 25. And uh, actually, they report CR rates of 80, 90 percent. But when you look at the total patients who were enrolled, the CR rate is 70 percent. The CR rate in salvage one with mini CVD in Oblina is close to 90 percent. In salvage two and three, it's 70 percent. So I think the chemotherapy with inotuzumab, if the aim is to bridge the patient to transplant, it gives you as good, if not a better CR rate than the CAR T cells. And also when you look at adult ALL, you find that the potential cure is only in patients with low disease burden. Now what is low disease burden? It's MRD positive disease. You can get as good results with blinatumumab. And that's why I think the CAR T cells, unless they are significantly improved in terms of efficacy, toxicity, and cost, still the chemotherapy with antibodies is superior to the current CAR T cells in adult and elderly ALL. So what are some of the new things? I mentioned we're doing ponatinib blinatumumab in Philadelphia positive ALL. I mentioned the chemotherapy with inoblina. I showed you the data in frontline therapy. In salvage, the CR rate is 90% with a three-year survival of 40%. What I will show you in the next slide is that venetoclax, navitoclax produces a response rate of 50% in refractory relapse ALL, but that's not as single agents. It's with the chemotherapy. So we still have to see what it does. There's a new blinatumumab subcutaneous formulation that could improve the outcomes. And at the bottom are a couple of potential strategies, maybe checkpoint inhibitors with Blina and the new CD20 antibody that is not bound to calicheamycin. This is the data with venetoclax, navitoclax in refractory relapse ALL. 32 patients were treated. The CR rate is 53%. But what's encouraging is four of the 17 patients achieved the CR with single agent venetoclax, navitoclax, before adding the chemotherapy. That's why I think BCL2 inhibitors will have a role in ALL, particularly in T-cell ALL. So the future, I think, is going to be with much less chemotherapy, chemotherapy with antibodies, perhaps with venetoclax, 
probably blinatumumab will replace the IV in a sub-Q formulation. I showed you that we need more CNS prophylaxis, particularly that we're using less systemic intensive chemotherapy. We need to improve the inotuzumab schedules. I show you that we're using half of the dose now. Uh, I think blinatumumab should, we give, should be given for longer than the FD approved dose. We will get subcutaneous blina. A very important question is when do you do the transplant after inotuzumab? And that's why we interjected the blinatumumab between the last dose of inotuzumab and stem cell transplantation to enhance the response and reduce the VOD incidence. So people say, well, what if the patients relapse? Actually, they are not relapsing. They are getting better in terms of MRD disease. Uh, and finally, we'll still have to redefine the role of the CAR T cells and allogeneic transplant in the context of the evolving new therapies. Thank you for your attention.